general and started being visual. So, um, so first is like, who am I? And, and, you know, again, I start pulling from my Luma background and go, well, that's kind of, I can use something like an abstraction ladder. At what level do I answer that? And, um, and so I, I kind of put the things that came to mind and rank them from the very high level and lofty. Well, I'm a human down to husband and father and all this stuff in the middle. And the thing that was interesting, just in visually, instead of writing something out in longhand is I started looking and saying, well, at the level at which you start thinking about problems, different things come to mind. So at the level of where I go, well, I, I, at the highest level, I'm just another human being on the planet. But that gives me uh, access to empathy and being empathetic with other human beings. So relatability, no matter what the, the design challenge is or no matter what the, the crisis is, at a fundamental level, you know, we're all humans. And so we have the ability to kind of empathize and connect there. And as you go down the list, there are these other things that added to these other facets. Um, I'm an Oregon resident. Well, that was directly because I embraced remote work. Um, in fact, when we met um, at the Google Design Sprint, um, that was also the first time I met several of, of my coworkers, including Haley Temple uh, on my team. And she and I have been rocking all sorts of webinars and blog posts and sessions. And we had never met. Really? So, I yeah, didn't that know that. That's fascinating. I just assumed that you guys were jetting all around, like <laughs> in other cities, you know, just kind of having like coffee at Chez Sway, wherever. <laughs> that's, that's what I didn't, I, no. I didn't, you know, and, and it was interesting. It was really at that moment where I really kept saying over and over to myself, remote is a real thing. I mean, you really can get a tremendous amount done. In fact, I'm more connected with, at a moment's notice, I can pivot from a quick call with um, a, a product team in Buenos Aires and then connect with Jim, um, Jim Callback, you know, on the East Coast. And then I'm talking with Vout, who's out in, you know, in the EU. Um, and, and so really uh, I'm closer and closer knit and more aligned with people that I have never actually met in person than I was with people I sat in huddled, you know, cubicle farms uh, mm -hmm. in past lives. So these other things, just being a designer at heart, I enjoy the craft, right? So everything um, that, uh, whatever the new skill is that I learn, I enjoy um, not just trying to knock it off on the list, but I try and savor what is it about this that's, that's very interesting and think about it. Um, you know, you mentioned a musician, I'm a hack, but that that is where I can take something that I love a little less seriously. And so that gives you access to play. Um, being a child of the 60s, uh, there's this whole world that Robert and I know that existed before the internet, right? Where what? technology- was the internet back in like- What? <laughs> and, and the thing that's funny is the lessons that we learned um, still apply. Right. There's still, you know, the fundamental way that things work, uh, devices work, the fundamental uh, challenges that teams might have around, um, you know, supply chain or anything that we learn pre-internet applies. It's it's almost like we just got the benefit of going to kindergarten, nursery school and some, some of those fundamental levels before we're just kind of jumping in at a, you know, kind of a collegiate technical level. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, being anyone who's got a uh, family as a, a parent, um, you know, patience and perspective, you know, is, and that, again, goes right back up to the top to empathetic, right? Um, so, so then I thought, well, people, you know, when people say, well, what do you do? That's always such a loaded question, you know, and, and so, again, I, 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 by instinct, kind of dip back into my Luma methodologies and said, well, it's kind of like a concept map. So let me just look at what are the things at any given day that I do? You know, well, there's a part of my job that is around um, really essentially trying to teach skills or get people to understand something in a way where they can kind of take ownership of it. Um, facilitation is a key role. Um, there's a, a lot of invention. You know, a lot of the ways that we're looking at services at Mural and a lot of the ways that uh, you might build a workshop, it's, it's almost like an inventor using... Uh, raw materials and pieces and pulling them together. Um, and, and a lot of what we do is remote. So anyway, I'm not going to pull this whole thing apart, but, but in there, you'll see that, you know, there, some highlights are, you know, failing. There's a lot of uh, things that don't work. And so that embracing iteration um, and, and taking failure and reminding yourself, well, you just got to learn why did this not work? 
the only failure is failing to learn from something you did or just do, doing it again, you know. Mm. Um, but, but in there is storytelling and collaboration and working remotely and visualizing things um, that, that really stand out for me when I think about a little bit of what is it that I love about what I do, but also what are the things that really enable me to be, you know, uh, an, an average Joe, but be outsized uh, impactful. Uh, it's because uh, the ability to reach uh, a variety of different teams and people with different skill sets and tapping that diversity um, and all kind of in the service of, of trying to design and build better experiences, uh, whether that's for your family or for a customer. So when I looked at at kind of my world before we uh, jump into some some questions or if there are anything, um, I just I, I took a step back and I thought, well, how do these things play together? So there's there are these these elements in my life, and you know, mural has become a, a rather large one, um, not because the software itself is is. I mean, I love the software itself, but it's almost a new kind of canvas. It's a new platform on top of which uh, I can make all sorts of experiences happen in real time and collaborate. And the fact that it's shared allows me to bring um, uh, all sorts of people, no matter where they are, into one conversation. And because it's virtual, we're not trying to work so much around schedules. Um, and we can work asynchronously, like we may do with that mural. If anyone throws something in there, I might not be able to get to it now, but you know, check in a day or two, and then I'll have stuff sorted in there. And so we're able to work in a way that we leverage tools like Slack or email, right? I'm thinking of something now, I'll send it to you. Now you noodle on it, you send it back to me. I can do the same thing with some of these, these new digital ways of working. Um, the remote collaboration, it's a unique skill set. And I think the, the things that you're doing with, with Global Virtual Design Sprints are so wonderful because they're giving people a, actual practice in developing skills and something I think is one of the most important 21st century skills um, is this ability to guide conversations um, using these still somewhat crude digital uh, tools. You know, we're not quite at the Jetsons with video TVs and AI robots that just read our minds and understand all our context. So it takes a heroic effort to, to take on uh, learning all the ins and outs of Zoom and Zoom webinar and, and other uh, platforms and Mural, a tool like Mural, even though it's set to be an easy to learn thing, it's a completely new skill set. Um, and then, you know, really when uh, being focused on uh, the education services and the design thinking, um, you know, the, the ability to really pull from all of these sources, have some tools, um, and, uh, and, and not only teaching people about design thinking, but design thinking itself allows services to be more agile and inventive and pivot and responsive, right? So we actually live design thinking and that uh, the more we learn about it, then the more we can share with audiences. Um, coming into here in the pipeline, I put Agile and Jobs to be Done. I know Jim's got a book coming out soon on that. So there are these other, what was that? I say, I'm definitely looking forward to that. No kidding. I mean, he's he's done an incredible job of uh, kind of shifting the, the mindset internally at Mural um, by really being a champion for Jobs to be Done. Um, and it, it's powerful once once you get into it. It's it it seems subtle and simplistic, uh, kind of like statement starters. Just how might we, and then fill in the sentence. You know, it seems so simple, mm -hmm. but there's a real art to understanding. You know, people uh, people may be carrying water in buckets, but it, it, you know they don't want a, a more comfortable handle on the bucket, or they don't want a bucket with a spout. They actually want a faucet in their house where they can just turn it on because what they're trying to do is wash their hands, not carry water. And, and I think once you kind of learn the ability to shift, all the work you've done to learn to be customer centered and, and human centered um, just comes into even more clarity. So, so um, I thought I'd uh, kind of pause there and back up and say, so, so here are some topics that I can, um, I can ease into. Um, one is around mural services specifically, um, kind of un unlocking a little bit more about human-centered design and, and what that is and what that looks like. 
um, talking about remote facilitation, which is a hot topic, or mural TV. And uh, do, you, do you have a preference or, or are there any questions? Well, we do have some people that are, that are on the call right now in Zoom, and uh, we're also on YouTube, so we're going to take 60 seconds. If anyone has a, feels strongly about a particular path, the choose your own adventure. There you like go. Mark Tippin. That's really what this entire thing should have been, just choose your own adventure <laughs> with Mark <laughs> <laughs> If you have particular ones that you'd like to do, mural services, human-centered design, remote facilitation, or mural TV, put that in the Zoom chat. And if you're watching on YouTube, go ahead and make a comment. And I'll do 60 seconds and I'll actually put a timer on so that we're being true to our, I'm true to my word. And uh, we'll do 60, do a minute to figure out where exactly people are going to uh, make their selection. There you go. And if you want to take a bathroom break, Mark can go ahead and do so. <laughs> Got it. No, I'm actually, I'm going to, I'm going to try and do a, a count and uh, see if I can tally up the, the votes as they're coming in. Okay. <laughs> Services, facilitation, there's two and two, the facilitation's ahead. Mural service facilitation, three and three. Mural services pulls ahead, four to three. All right. We have 30 seconds left. And no double voting, because I'm keeping track of the names. <laughs> Not that anyone would kind of be. Uh... <laughs> I was going to say, wow, you're just, you're way more on top of like it. It's a, what, what happened? What was that word? No. Uh, let's see. Oh, we got remote facilitation on YouTube. Oh, there you go. <laughs> oh, and funny enough, that was a phone call. That was even my alarm. Okay. <laughs> I was going to say, your alarm sounds surprisingly like many phones I know. <laughs> I, give, I give myself a phone call so, so that it's the alarm's actually like, it, it'll go on every phone that I own so that I never miss <laughs> it. Someday... I'm going to sit down and unpack all your process because you blow my mind with how much you get done in any given 24 hour period. No sane human wants to go down that path ever. <laughs> ever. Right. Well, so it looks right. like remote facilitation has edged out mural services by a score of five to four. You can confirm Mark on your side. Yep, I do five to four. Right. Sounds good. So I'll do facilitation. I'll go into services and then um, we'll ease through time permitting. Got it. Um, all right, so let me zoom in here. So the first thing that I'll share is, um, you know, if you uh, if you are interested in this topic, um, uh, Jim Callback and I wrote this book uh, last year, and it's specifically for people that have some facilitation awareness, um, but are maybe used to doing it in an analog session in rooms with uh, posters and post-it notes and that kind of thing. And this, um, while it is published and branded mural, et cetera, it's not so much about just, you know, 80 pages of by mural. Uh, it, it does show examples of how mural can be used in these things, but it also has uh, sample agendas, um, uh, really how to unpack and think about translating things that work in an analog sense. Um, and kind of it grounds you in in some of the conversations that you really need to have with your teams and your clients around uh, standardizing in a set of tools that create your digital workspace, uh, understanding team shape. Um, so teams have shapes. And, and so we've, we've learned this at Mural. Uh, and I'll unpack that a little bit as well. Uh, and then also uh, the techniques. Just don't assume that because you did something, you know, like round robin, if you're familiar with that, it involves one person starting and then you pass them. Well, how do you pass in a virtual world? There, there's no one-to-one -one communication. There are ways to make it work, but don't book a, a session with, you know, the executive staff and then five minutes beforehand, just walk into the room and think it's all going to work magically in mural. It takes time to prep. Um, so uh, you can also get that book uh, for free if you want hardcover. I, I'm sure it's on Amazon. Uh, if you want to uh, download it, follow that link. Um, but I also wanted to share a little bit about what what that book, what this kind of analog format looks like when you explode it into a virtual conversation. And uh, this mural, this is a screenshot of a mural, unpacks all of the information in what we call a presentation uh, mural canvas. And so all of the topics are laid out. And again, this is why I, am, I'm, I find it so compelling to work um, in, in the way that I do is because a PowerPoint deck, a book, these things are all very linear. And when you get into um, assets like these, 
um, you really can uh, can flow through the information. People can get to, you know, uh, topic seven, safety and confidence, and then go, well, I, I was curious, maybe uh, I had a question now about techniques. You don't have to go back, 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 back through your PowerPoint deck. You just pan over and zoom in to that, uh, that information. Mm -hmm. And, and it's how we think, right? Sometimes we need to go in and really have a focused conversation about a topic. And then sometimes we need to back up and, and do a reality check and go, are, are we still on track? Have we gotten you know, into the minutia? And so naturally working in this new way and learning how to facilitate that for other people really unlocks doors. Um, and it's collaborative. It's participate. You can participate in these things. Um, we often, uh, in the middle of these topics, we have areas we've built out where people um, you know, uh, add their notes, and then we might do a little affinity cluster or a little ranking. And so there's uh, not just passive watching these things, but it's a structured discussion that winds through these topics with everyone kind of confirming knowledge of checking assumptions through every step. And it's a much more interesting uh, experience. And from, from my seat in services, when I'm thinking of building these things out, the the flexibility I have to take one asset like this and then essentially teach um, an infinite number of different style or flavored workshops, uh, depending on the customer. Maybe they're they're very fluid in in one aspect of this. So great. Well, I don't. We don't have to spend much time there. We can just check the boxes quickly and then spend more time in another area. So for those that might be listening, that might be consultants. Uh, one quick pitch for the Mural Consultant Network. Uh, we have a network. We're happy to empower you with the tools so you can you know, use those, uh, experiment with yourself and use those with your customers. Um, but it also gives you the ability to package these things and, uh, and it becomes a little more scalable because you can use these artifacts in, uh, in dynamic ways. So without going through, because that's a whole you know, uh, three-hour workshop that we do, I wanted to highlight just a couple things that I think are really really important. One is these team shapes. Oftentimes, uh, companies will give people, here's a laptop, here's your software, and here's a project, go solve it. And they haven't really taken time to think about um, the, the shape of the team. What do I mean by that? So if you look at these, um, these graphics, the, uh, the things that look like a little marker in a Google map represent co-located groups, right? So the first type of group we have is co-located where you just have a, and everyone comes into one office. Um, and some, some companies are still oriented that way. The next one we have is split, which is like where you have a New York office and a Paris office, right? So you've got two large co-located entities that somehow have to coordinate between each other. Well, if you think about it, they're each remote to each other. So that's even though they're, they, they say we're co-located, um, they do themselves a service by uh, introducing these tools and helping people build confidence around these remote collaboration skills. Mm -hmm. The third one is uh, mixed, where you might have a big central office, but you're starting to have lots of remote folks. And that's the experience I had at Autodesk that really drove me to try and find a solution like Mural and uh, really uh, look for ways to bring those people, not just as orbiting satellites that occasionally we check in with, but have them contribute materially to what we're doing. And now, of course, there's the fully remote team and there this is becoming more and more common. The thing that I want to highlight here is the numbers uh, if you look at the two numbers on the left, those are stable or slightly declining. And the numbers on the right, anything that has a remote attached to it is ticking upwards. Um, I, in, in prepping, I was trying to find the latest numbers. These are from 2018, um, but both of these have trended uh, upwards. So what does that tell me? Any investment you make in remote facilitation in learning uh, how to take the uh, the innate skills you have and the facilitation chops that you've learned in the analog world and start taking the heroic effort to learn these tools and, and risk failing, but building up the, the muscles in this new way is only going to make you more invaluable going forward. Mm -hmm. um, and the last thing I'll share is don't underestimate how complex things can get, um, especially because a lot of you are going to find yourself in uh, mixed environments where you've got uh, people in a room and you've got remote. 
And so, um, you know, in this, this diagram, this is kind of my, I, I get real angsty when we have clients that want to run workshops this way, <laughs> because I have absolute confidence. You want to do it in person, co-located analog or with mural. That's fine. Everyone in the same room. Cool. Everyone remote. Cool. Playing fields leveled. Everyone's got audio, video cameras, access to mural. That's no problem. It's when you've got some people in the room and some people remote. How do the people in the room stay connected to the people that are remote? You've got to have three devices up in the front for a presentation, a shared collaboration workspace, the Hollywood Squares video. So I would just, you know, cautionary tale from someone who's been burned multiple times and learned the hard way. If you're planning on doing some of these sessions and it, it has some in-person and some remote, really spend some time and map it out because it can be super impactful if you pull it off. Um, but it's not something that just happens at the last minute. It takes a lot of planning. And it's the, <clears throat> if I may add, cause I'm, I've been in that, that, that boat on, on the fiery lake and kind of yeah. trying to swim all across it. So I know what you're talking about. Yeah. It, it really comes down to prep preparing and assuming that everyone's just going to come to it. And, and the, the, the thought is that everything's going to work. Just right. I'm gonna go in and everything's. It's kind of like walking to a restaurant. I'm gonna have my bread. I'm gonna have my salad. The salad's gonna yeah. come on time. You just assume certain things. Whereas you're the cook in the kitchen or you're the server, you gotta no. make sure everything works. And the more it's, time you can spend on that, figuring out yeah. the nuances, the the less headaches you're gonna have in the, in the when it actually goes down. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. It's um, and and it can be the things that you don't you really don't expect. We ran a, a session, um in Portland recently. And, um, you know, our assumption was, I, I just said, do you have Wi-Fi? Yeah, we got Wi-Fi. Uh, do you have guest Wi-Fi? Yeah, we got guest Wi-Fi. Cool. So I assumed everyone will show up and there's a guest account. New, it's a multi-step. The people had to log into the form. They had to punch in their phone number. They got a confirmation code. We burned the first 20 minutes just trying to get people on Wi-Fi. And you know, so now my my uh, my protocol for asking about Wi-Fi <laughs> gets a little more specific, but you only learn that by doing or by paying attention to other people that are willing to share, you know, some of that pain with you. So you can just be mindful of it. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So um, so remote facilitation at a high level. Um, so the services was the other thing that that uh, that got some attention in the voting. So um, years ago, when I first joined Mural, I, I was talking with Mariano, who um, I really uh, love our CEO. He's so, so passionate and um, it's so visual, you know, he comes from a game gaming company background and um, you know, Mural was born out of their frustration, trying to present super expansive game ideas in a PowerPoint deck. Right. And so he, he just thought there must be a better way to represent these nonlinear lateral storylines. And here you have Mural. So um, all the way down to the very Genesis story for this thing, game, gaming and playfulness uh, is kind of at the heart of it. And it occurred to me that that, um, you know, the the Mural itself is like a platform, like the Super Nintendo. And then things like, you know, Agile and uh, uh, design sprints, uh, human-centered design workshops, um, mood boards, any marketing, HR, what if scenarios, all those things are like different programs that you can put into Mural and play these different types of experiences out. Um, and then the device you use is kind of like the controller. And since we're on a lot of different platforms, the experience can vary widely. So, you know, people say, well, when you're building out these things, what do you use? Well, I, I use a Mac laptop and Chrome because that's kind of like this super crazy, you know, it's got all the whistles and bells and controls and admin tools and all that stuff, right? So if I'm a power user, that's probably how I'm going to access it. When you get to iPad Pro, it, you know, we've kind of streamlined the interface and treated it kind of like a participatory app. So it's, you can do most everything, but you can't do heavy admin of users and all that kind of stuff, right? So services primarily exist to kind of keep adding more titles to play. Um, and 
Um, and we, you know, we're looking for new things all the time. I'm going to give a little bit of a plug here to an announcement that we're, we're making uh, with a, a fabulous uh, team based in Vancouver. Um, and their whole focus is on um, team trust and team forming. Um, and so their, their technology, um, people often say, is it like MTBI or is it like DISC? It's like all those things, but we like it because um, it's more emergent and as opposed to you being told kind of who you are and how you are and given a playbook on how to relate to these other kind of people. Um, it's something that just talks about your strengths and everyone has these basic strengths. Um, we either are action oriented, we like to plan stuff out, we like to think about it, or we're super intuitive. And so this technology allows teams to in 20 minutes kind of get a baseline and assessment and then uh, understand each other's strengths. And of course, the fifth uh, strength is imagination. And so this aligns very well with mural and trying to empower imagination workers, right? Because everyone's got a different kind of makeup. Robert, you are super like planning an action, right? I, I don't even, if you took this assessment, I would bet that red and yellow are competing for first place, right? And, um, but uh, when you're looking across a team, it's really, it's really interesting just to see that. So taking something that, that exists and then bringing it in and allowing teams to kind of have access to new technology, um, that's what we do. Um, and uh, and really quick, Mark, by the way, yeah. there was a question that came in about Prelude in that yeah. they were, uh, Karen from Plymouth, Michigan was asking, yeah. um, you know, how you use Prelude to build teams. So I think sure. that was kind of uh, bridged into that with uh, the, the, the process that they had talked about, or you bet you just talked about. Yeah, you bet. Well, um, I'll just, uh, I'll dip in here a little bit because I do find it interesting and, um, and we're rolling this out internally. So we're using this assessment in, in internally at Mural for all the employees. So, so essentially what you have is, um, you know, a, a 20 minute uh, a, a self-assessment that gives you a breakdown percentages across um, how the, those four strengths that I mentioned, everyone gets 100% on imagination because we're, we're all naturally uh, imaginative in how we manage to put food on the table day after day after day. You get pretty creative, yeah. right? Yeah, it's, um, it's, it's a never ending fantasy. That's right. That's right. Never ending event. Well, it'll end at some point. We don't talk about yeah, it. It's a little yeah. bleak. Um, but uh, there are lots of ways uh, to kind of unlock that. We look at this as kind of like a super intentional warm up exercise where teams that are coming together for the first time, um, well, like I mentioned, you're typically given here's your laptop. <laughs> you know, here's your Wi Fi. Here's your office. Here's your coffee machine. And here's your problem, go solve it. But nothing is ever done to actually allow that team to get to know each other mm -hmm. and to understand the strengths, right? For me, the planning and the scheduling and the logistics is like pulling teeth. I'm not good at it. I don't enjoy it. It stresses me out. And so in most of my career, I would take on those jobs because I thought if I hate it this much, there are other people that must hate it 50 times worse than me and I want to do them a favor, but I was horrible at it. Right. As opposed to understanding that I'm really good with the, the visualizing and the intuitive. And before I can verbalize something, I instinctively know kind of how to follow a path. So I pair myself with people that are action and planning oriented. And then together, um, we actually get a ton of stuff done. Mm -hmm. So, so without dwelling on it too much, the, the, the way that we're using their technologies, we're bringing it into Mural in a way where people can use like these power words that are oriented around these four strengths. And then they pull out and, and actually visualize and share back to the team. What does it mean for them to have these strengths in this combination? What does it mean about the way they work and what they value? Um, and so very quickly teams can align with each other and uh, develop that that trust and you're talking about stuff other than the problem solving mm -hmm. and that fundamentally that puts an incredible layer underneath any interaction that you have and then when you scale that up to an org you know it really helps developers analytical people talk with the creative design types and et cetera et cetera so if you ever want to test your hypothesis about me being yellow and red and kind of dominating that space, I'd be more than happy to try it out and let you know. We can see. You what bet. You, you bet. I'd uh, absolutely. I'd, I'll I'll hook you up. Um, and and that would be great. That would be great. Um, so 
uh, I've kind of, I, maybe I've touched on this a little bit, maybe in the intro where I was talking about, well, it's, you know, it's being visual, working visually and working remote. And, and um, with, with the services conversation, we're thinking it's not so much about drawing. People say, I don't have good drawing skills. I'm not an artist. I'm like, it's not about that. Like Dan Rome, Back of the Napkin, uh, Suni Brown, The Doodle Revolution, you know, these people are all reminding us that the industrial revolution made it really important for education to get to get everyone educated on reading, writing, and arithmetic, right? Mm -hmm. And arts was kind of nice to have. Well, now we're we're dealing with a completely new revolution, um, uh, an information revolution, and we're dealing remotely, and we're dealing across time zones, and we're dealing across very co complex. VUCA is a term I learned at Autodesk and I loved. Volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. That's just, that's the nature of work now, right? You can't just go on an assembly line and make sure the aspirins aren't chipped and get a gold watch in 50 years. That kind of work is just completely gone. In fact, the, probably most of the people listening don't even know what I'm talking about, but that was the industrial revolution, repeatable things that are the same over and over again. You get on the, the escalator of your job and you get off at some point and retire. Um, I, you know, I've had to, and, and, and like you, Robert, you, you saw an opportunity and completely pivoted in your career and said, Dallas design sprints, let's give it, you know, let's do this. Um, and same way I was, you know, I'm a UX design manager. Well, no, I'm not. I'm actually a visual communicator. Now I, I went on this new path and this, this job didn't exist five years ago. So you have to be, um, you have to develop these new tools. And what essentially happens between all these teams, you've got teams that work in really different worlds. Um, going back to my time at Autodesk, I was really fascinated with the, the teams that came together to do things like build and design cars. And, you know, some of us gravitate towards, you know, the, the look of it, the aesthetics of it, but there's a lot of uh, science materials expertise behind it. There's a lot of compliance, you know, uh, stuff that, that has, you know, California emissions versus any other state. And, and so you have these different teams and the, the tools that they look at are very different. Designers are doing kind of very sketchy, cool art looking stuff. The materials folks are thinking in this type of way. How, what's a tensile strength? When does steel snap? And, um, and you know, whereas the, the language and the, the tools in the aesthetics world are heuristics and user experience and design thinking, you know, the, the material science folks have their ISO standards and their other w terms that they use and the tools that they use to understand. And the same with the folks that are dealing with, you know, uh, compliance and regulation. But Mural, the thing that I love about it and services mission to keep adding new games to play is because over and over again, these teams need to step out of their world, out of their art box, out of their project planning, out of their material science software and testing labs. And they need to come together and share their component of the overall problem. And that's where Mural sits. It gives everyone the ability. I can see what you're doing without having a seat of JIRA. You know, Jira is great for my engineering team where they're going to live and dwell and work and everything. But when I actually need that diversity, that just happens over and over again. And it's the ability for that to have plug whatever you want in there, plug agile, plug design thinking, plug stage gate, plug waterfall for whatever. You just plug whatever your process or methodology is in there. And it's the ability to do this remotely that allows the evolution of all this stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, how are we doing on time? We have about 12 minutes left. Um, okay. I mean, uh, where would you like to take things? We could continue on with the color sections or we could take these last, uh, last minutes and basically open it up for questions based on the two, uh, parts of your, of your present presentation that you've given. Um, and then we can kind of feel those all the way up until the top of the hour. How does that sound? That, that sounds good. That sounds good. And I'll leave a few minutes at the end for anything you'd like to kind of highlight and uh, present to everyone that's watching and listening okay. so that they can know where to go for more information. Sounds good. Right. So if you are on Zoom or on YouTube, uh, I'm checking both of those.
feel free to put in any questions or Q&A. We also have a mural board that I put into the Zoom chat. You can go ahead and uh, mosey on over there and put stickies, or you can leave it pristine and wide open if you want to. It's totally up to you. But we, all, we do want to get your feedback right now on uh, what you've seen so far. Any questions you have for Mark, now is the time to ask them because both of us probably have something to go to at the top of the hour. And we, we definitely want to take these, these last 10 minutes and make them worthwhile. So please feel free to ask any questions you have. And if you don't ask questions, it's going to be my platform to ask. <laughs> Just ask a whole bunch of stuff. I'll open with this while we're waiting for the questions. Mm -hmm. Let's, uh, let's do this. One of the things, um, I'd like to ask you about Mark is actually nothing to do with mural and something that I, I, heard through another mural employee that you used to be in the music business. <laughs> Would you like to uh, kind of uh, expand on that just for a, a bit? Oh, while, oh while sure. Kind of ask some well, well, child of the 60s means that I'm actually coming of age and, and asserting my unique identity kind of in the 80s. Late, late 70s and 80s. Um, and I happen to be in the Bay Area, which was a very interesting time um, uh, if you're interested in forming a band. So if you, if you do a search on Google, Google Image Search, Mark Tippin and Punk, you'll probably find a few images um, of uh, when I had a 14 inch Mohawk and I was in a band. Uh, don't bother look. I, I, I think I, there's probably some stuff uh, strewn around the internet in very dark corners. So I wouldn't encourage anyone to go sort trying to find any of that stuff. The, but, question um, is, the question I have for you though, is, is that if I put Mark Tip and punk into the image search in mural, will I get the, the search results I'm looking for? It's Bing. Yeah, I don't know. Actually, I'm, I'm edged out by someone who has no relation to me, but Aaron Tippin, a country and Western singer, usually any Tippin in music, uh, even if you put in punk, uh, you know, Aaron uh, kind of edges me out on a lot of that stuff. Thank, you, I, thank goodness for SEO in that regard, right? That's right. <laughs> exactly. your path, and nobody has to figure it out. I'm sure there was a period there where he's like, who the hell is this Mark Tippin guy? You know, like, <laughs> and I have to meet him. That's right. <laughs> so Ken we'll see says if... he also grew up in the Bay Area in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, so he's wondering what the name of your band was. Uh, it, anxiety. There's a, we played a lot of shows at Gilman Street in Berkeley, so um, never the same weekend with Rancid or Green Day, but um, they were you know, they were in that, that tribe playing shows. And, and there's a lot of that DIY culture that absolutely relates to what I'm doing today. Part of it is also um, the, the daring and the risk. I had some horribly embarrassing moments, uh, you know, on stage at the On Broadway, which was a classic venue in San Francisco. And we needed a new lead singer. I just uh, met this guy recently. He gets up there and starts spewing a bunch of vitriol uh, against uh, uh, people. And I was like, that, that's not even anything to do with anything we're doing. I went up to the microphone to tell him to shut up and their wiring is not to standard. So I completed a 120 volt connection between my hand and my guitar and the microphone. So all anyone saw was me scream and fall off the stage. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and so, so once you have an experience like that, you know, getting up in front of people and running workshops, it's like, how bad can it be? It, you know? <laughs> yes. Compared to being, yeah. Comparing to electrocuting yourself and almost dying. I mean, if you want the extreme, yeah. This, <laughs> this, this, this is child's play compared to it's that. It's child's play. That's right. I, I mean, I, I didn't even think that. I just thought you were in a rivalry with Green Day and, and Rancid and others. You were tearing down their papers on the on the oh, no. clubs around town and putting your own up there, and they do the same. So oh. if, if you ever cross paths in an airport sometime, you're still going to leer at them because they're going to go, that guy. <laughs> They'll know. In fact, I think the only claim to fame um, that we had is uh, Tony Sly went on to – uh, unfortunately he passed away a couple years ago but he was um he went on to do great things with no use for a name and a solo career and um the stories that came back to me were pretty amazing when he'd go into poor countries uh you know south america and play these concerts he would just go buy a bazillion soccer balls and throw them out you know and and just you know uh, so uh, that's the only claim to fame i have is that the first band that tony sly was ever in was uh, our band Cool. practiced in 
in Los Altos. Well, you, you have that. You have that. That you had to have hang your hat on. Besides That's almost right. dying, you had you had, <laughs> you had like cross paths with somebody that eventually like right. got somewhere in the music industry. Besides right. a little bit of street credibility with my son too, just a little. There was got to be a couple of fans too that basically said, you know, they 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 didn't say much, but they came to your concerts all the time, and you know. <laughs> It was fun. Well, it was a community. And, and so there's a lot of that, that, that I'm, I'm finding again with my gray hair and, you know, lack of hair. Um, it's, there's still a, a lot of that vibe. Um, you know, some tremendous musicians down in um, uh, our uh, South American office. And, and <laughs> I was embarrassed. They're saying like, Oh, Mark's a musician, and everything. And then they show me videos they're shooting with their GoPros and their studios down there. I'm like, you guys should have a contract. <laughs> I'm wearing, see, I'm wearing a mural t-shirt. So this was given to me at the, at the Google Design Sprint Conference and I'll kind of go up like this. Thank you very much, Mural, for doing that. You were very, very generous and gracious. And I wore it specifically for this uh, particular awesome. AMA. But I think you ought to find some picture from anxiety, the anxiety days of you having sporting that huge mohawk, yelling at something or getting electrocuted, whatever. And wearing that as a t-shirt when you go to, for the first time to meet people and go, yeah, so you just know that I'm this luminary and I'm really smart. I'm also no music and I, I, I almost died while being on stage. So I've got street. There friends. you go. <laughs> um, Jerome Fromau, he is, uh, he's from the Endoven area in the Netherlands. And I pride myself now in slaughtering his name every time I say it because I can never say it right. He's an entrepreneur, a leadership coach and design thinker. And he was on YouTube and asked the question, how are you seeing the potential of AR and VR as a new dimension for Mural? Yeah, so that's really interesting. I um, I've been uh, uh, fascinated with um, with virtual presence since uh, my first tour of duty at Autodesk. Um, they were early in um, you know virtual reality when the internet Johnny Mnemonic, you know, really dating myself, but the really early days of cyberspace as a as a concept, and. Um, <clears throat> And the early military applications with um, face-shaped TV tubes. Did you know about any of this, Robert? Mm -hmm. I do. Yeah, 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 yeah. So it's um, very interesting to to try and get as close as we can to the actual presence because I think that's still missing. Um, I, there's some some t uh, technologies that we've seen where you know people strap on the goggles and they can look around the room and the people from virtual areas kind of pop in. It's um, it requires so much hardware that I, I, I the setup is not really practical for the way um, work really happens. Like I'm just in my, you know, I'm, I'm in one of the rooms in my house, and you know, so are most of the people I work with. So setting up all of the trackers and things to be able to create that presence, I'm not sure if the investment really gets us that one step closer. There might be. Um, you know, applications in, in medicines and uh, psychological counseling and things where the human presence really adds this extremely valuable dimension. But I, I think it's there. One thing I can say is <clears throat> um, in, in the iOS version of the app we have, um, we, we used to have a, a tool a long time called Mural Scan, and that allowed people to basically take video of a wall of post-it notes and pull them in. And um, it was a huge effort. And we, you know, it kind of, we parked it for a while and we were just saying, well, it's a little hard to do because we'd have to code everything. Then suddenly Microsoft releases their APIs for their AR environments and all this code becomes uh, uh accessible, you know, a lot of stuff that grew out of Xbox and everything. So suddenly what was like this Herculean task became a, a library, another library that we could leverage. And so now in the iOS app, <clears throat> when you hit the little plus icon, there's a camera icon and you can do all sorts of things. You can just take a picture and it'll drop it in the mural, or you can say scan a wall. And when you move the iPad around, it does point detection. It figures out where the wall is, and then it starts sucking in the notes and the colors and you know, what so, I think, what, you know what I would, if I could do a vote on something I'd love to see Mural do is you have the one dimension canvas. I would like actually like it if you could do something where you could flip the canvas. So you, you it's mm -hmm. like you have all of your work on one side, <clears throat> but let's say there's a little icon in the upper left and the upper right where it says flip, or it says like what you, you can go from like a flat surface. And when you flip it, the mural basically flips. So now you're on the opposite side of what you're currently looking at. Interesting. And, you can absorb things back in, into on the other side, so you can you can literally be like similar to your outline tool, 
you can do something where it's like it's like a, a shift so you can do like before and afters you could do some right. something like that but it's still the same uh it's just combining two different uh like mural kind of layers in one um yeah i think there's um some so one of the 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 things that is not obvious is every mural is a real-time document right if if i gave you the the keys to this you could come in and select everything and delete it and now the current state of the document is blank now i do have a history where i can go back and replace things but um versioning is something that that uh, uh people are interested in or a timeline where can we scrub and actually kind of see a time lapse of of how we got to where we got and i think those are interesting but i i'm guessing the the next big evolution of this is going to be with um, objects that have some structured data in them, right? Mm -hmm. So if I was doing story pointing for a, an agile sprint, um, that I'd be able to to drag objects. And if I type in that this is worth eight story points and this is worth 12, as I drag them in, I can get an aggregate total. So my interactivity in real time becomes a little more data driven what if. Um, I think that's that's uh, has huge potential in a lot of uh, a lot of areas. Yeah, I sense that especially on the enterprise side, there's going to be the portability and the API integration of different types of data sets to kind of um, almost like a data modeling where where Mural can kind of you know how it takes in like just stickies that it sees through scans. You just basically project that out in terms of like. You know, you had that graphic that showed that people from different uh, disciplines and different ways of communicating and information come to Mural and it's a common platform. I think it's strengthening those arrows that kind of point to that, mm -hmm. uh, where now it's it's much less that they have to kind of re re uh, project out what they do inside of the Mural uh, mm -hmm. metaphor. It's literally where the Mural metaphor can act can be translated through an API and takes the data and reformats it so that it's now on the platform, but it's less of a cognitive load or even um, a task that somebody has to do to bring in their information from JIRA or someplace else. Absolutely. Yeah, integrations is a huge, huge focus for us going forward. Um, and I think that's where, you know, when we look at the competitive landscape, there's, you know, there are other tools that are making it easy and what we're exploring, but also a lot of tools that have that integration advantage. Um, but I think the, you know, foundationally, we've gotten the experience right for the facilitators and for the, the users. Um, and so I think it's, it's just, it's our, um, our race to lose, you know, to, to get that stuff going. I'm sure you guys will do just fine. <laughs> we can can uh, also mention the, how about clicking to save a state and then recall those snapshots of the board? You know, I love that idea as well. Um, and, uh, and I think borrowing from, you know, the, from the video metaphor, where are the keyframes in the experience? Um, and I think that also loops into storytelling, you know, when you need to share back, you know, a full day workshop or multiple section workshop, how can you condense that down to really, as a team, understand where were the key points where you made decisions and when in a particular trajectory. Also, because if you end up where you didn't expect to or where it, you didn't find the value, you can go back to one of those key points where you said, we could choose path A or B and we chose one, let's try choosing the other one and then running through the exercises again. Yeah, and real quick from Frank, he's asking Mural and Android. Yes. So um, it's on the roadmap. It has been for a long time. I feel your pain. I've got an Android non-Mac phone. And, uh, and, um, and I think one of the things that I, I hope, I hope I'm not going to get into trouble, but the, the thing I hope they actually put back in is a very simple share model. We used to have this concept of an inbox. And so it was a, it was actually a web page. So it would load on everything, but you pick the color of the sticky note and you can use your device keyboard to type it in and you hit send and it would just show up in a little inbox in the corner on the mural. And then a facilitator that's in the room or whatever can take contributions from you while you're literally just listening to the zoom call on a train, you can still contribute. And I think exploring some of those simple share, simple participation models, what Mentimeter does, the easy ability just to come in and have like a word cloud form on mural with all the attendees. I think these things would add huge value from it, around engagement. Um, and then it becomes an artifact that becomes like, but the, but the contribution doesn't require quite the steep 
on-ramp of learning the tool. It's simple interaction, participatory. And probably, and we're probably doing some real-time controlled experiments in, in with the public and, and ran, randomized. I think I saw somebody. There was a trio that was that was being passed around on LinkedIn. I think it was. I remember who posted it, but someone where they were doing controlled experiments in 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 the wild for prototypes and for ideas, so that literally you don't have to have like curated uh, uh, crowd to do testing with. You could just basically, you know, find out if if what what the what the experience actually works for them. So you could take those ideas and kind of run with them. So yeah, we're we're now we're yeah. getting close to five minutes. Uh, let's close out. And uh, what would you like everyone who's listening and watching to know uh, about you or where they should go next for more information? I know we have Mural TV up, so maybe that's a good a good segue into that. Exactly. So we have we have two programs. Um, uh, that we're, we're running. Um, Mural TV is not an official title. So uh, I, it's just an internal moniker for what we're trying to do. Like um, it. It, so it, it's sticky. So, uh, you know, <laughs> but we also don't want to get sued by MTV. So we have to be careful about <laughs> well, that. You can, that play with, you can play with the letters a bit. A little bit. Yeah. The um, the experience lab uh, and I shared a link so um, uh, just uh, it's it, it's kind of invitation only but for anyone that happens to be on this call and for your cohort um, I'm happy to extend that to them um, we, we run them twice a month they're 90 minutes and they're uh, they're hands on so it's a it's a small focus it's like a mini 90 minute workshop and we focus on specific things like you know a method abstraction laddering or uh, problem tree analysis that kind of stuff so you'll actually get hands-on at the end you get a template that you can take back to your teams to use the method which contrasts with backstage pass which is an hour we do it every week um and we uh it's real work. So uh, it, it's a real team doing real work for an hour. Um, it, we use mural webinar. So you don't actually participate, but you're welcome to dial in, watch, and then in the chat, comment, feedback, ask questions, that kind of stuff. So it's lightly participatory. Um, it's open to everyone. The, uh, <clears throat> the two different projects that we're running here, um, one is for people that really want the hands-on like learning by doing and other people that want to see lots of scenarios because our mission is to show lots of different use cases. We negotiated, started negotiating a social contract between our enterprise transformation managers and the sales team. That was a session to see blank canvas. How do you do, how do you structure this conversation? How does that work? So mm -hmm. the topics are always changing. So cool. um, feel free to tune into either of those. And thanks again, Robert, for the time. This was, this was a blast. And, yeah, you're welcome. And, and of course, you're putting your information up on the screen and how to get in contact with you, both of the Lumen Institute. Uh, Mark Tippin, I believe that is, that is not Twitter. Uh, That's, it, which one is that? It is Twitter, yeah. Oh, it is Twitter, never mind. It is Twitter, yeah. So it is Twitter, and there's the email address. So if you want to, uh, if you want a signed copy of the, the, the punk band Anxiety, <laughs> like thing, you can go ahead and reach out to him about that. There you um, go. Well, Mark, thanks again for all your time. I always, I, I love seeing your presentations and hearing more about what Mural has to do or what they're, what they're up to. Um, I'm sure we're going to talk again in the future, but thanks again for your time today. And, you know, you bet. Hope, yeah, hope you enjoy the rest of the week. And uh, yeah. And you bet. Good, well, good th time. thank you. And good luck with the global virtual design sprints. It's a huge effort and we love watching and seeing how it evolves. Cool. Good luck to you. All right. Take care, Mark. I'll talk to you later. Okay. All right. Take care, Robert. All right. Bye-bye. And bye -bye. thanks, everyone, for watching and listening. Appreciate it. See you next time. Tomorrow. There's somebody new. Okay? <laughs> Bye, everybody. Bye-bye.